dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. It is very clear that we are made up of the body, soul, spirit. This assertion is further supported in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is further consolidated in Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hair. The spirit and soul are clearly identified, whereas the body is represented by joints and marrow. We will endeavor to explain the function of each part. Body, mind, or your body, relates to the physical world, this world. This is in reference to sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch. And for the body's welfare, Jesus says that man shall not live by bread alone, according to Matthew 4, verse 4. We see that the body is a house that carries the spirit, as mentioned in Genesis 2, verse 7, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Soul. The soul is the result of the spirit being breathed into the body, according to Genesis 2, verse 7, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We will come back to explain the soul more after explaining the spirit. Spirit. The spirit relates to the spirit world. In this case, as believers, it is the one that can relate to God, because John 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit and can only be related to in the spirit, hence the need for you and me to be born again. To be born again is to be regenerated in the spirit so that we are reconciled to God, according to Romans 10 verses 9 to 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Regeneration happens to your spirit, not the body. It is in the spirit that we find faith, hope, reverence, prayer, worship. These things that we find in the spirit are non-functional in the body. For example, faith is not in the body, but in the spirit. Jesus teaches us this in Matthew 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here it's clear. Bread is for the body, and the word that proceeds from the mouth of God is for the spirit, the abode of faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. This is why Romans 10 verse 17 directs the word to the spirit. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Ephesians 6 verse 16 In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The arrows of the evil one cannot be fought in the body or flesh, sometimes referred to as carnality. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish
our strongholds. Our weapons of warfare are in the spiritual realm and not in the flesh. I am convinced that this teaching has been helpful to you and that you will attend to your well-being with wisdom, according to 3 John 2, verse 2. Dear friend, I am praying that all is well with you and that you enjoy good health in the same way that you prosper spiritually. Soul. The soul is the mediator between the body and spirit. The soul is that realm created when God put the spirit in the body, according to Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The tug of war between the spirit and the body takes place in the soul. The soul is the arena where the two clash. The soul follows the victor. The soul is the will. I think. I want. I will. Reason. Intellect. Emotions. Affections. Memory. Conscience. Perversion. You and I as believers have to understand this. In the soul you find one's will. But when you and I come to the Lord, we have to deal with God's will. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. It is the soul that carries the will, the want of the body to fornicate. The spirit has to be fed with God's will until it overcomes or sways the body to its side. Constant feeding of the word makes the spirit the giant and takes command of the soul. 1 Peter 2 verse 15 For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. God's will in your spirit through the word of God is able to influence or alter your ego, so that it will align with that of God. The memory is in the soul, that betrayal or that divorce, but the wounds manifest in the soul. The word heals the wounds and tames the soul on the betrayal or divorce, because it's tailored to deal with such. The maker of mankind, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have produced a manual, the Bible, to deal with the ups and downs of mankind. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The word of God is there to deal with life's residue that is in the soul. I am convinced that this teaching has been helpful to you, and that you will attend to your well-being with wisdom, according to 3 John 2, verse 2. Dear friend, I am praying that all is well with you, and that you enjoy good health, in the same way that you prosper spiritually. It is your responsibility to feed your spirit man, be faithful to your devotions, and your spirit will grow into a giant and have dominion over your soul and body. That there are two invisible spiritual kingdoms that are at war with one another. One is the kingdom of Satan, and the other is the kingdom of God. Now, I imagine most of you have no problem with the concept that God has a kingdom. Some of you may not be aware that Satan has a kingdom, but he does. And it's most important for us as Christians that we understand the nature of his kingdom and how it operates. Because if we are in the kingdom of God through Christ, we are automatically at war with the kingdom of Satan. Understand Suppose I were a citizen of, let's say, Australia, and Australia was at war, which God forbid, with New Zealand. If, if, if it was so, then 
as a citizen of Australia, I would automatically be war at war with New Zealand because I belong to a nation that is at war with another nation. So if the kingdom of God is at war with the kingdom of Satan, and we are in the kingdom of God, then we have no options. We are automatically at war with the kingdom of Satan. And it's very important for us to know it, to understand the nature of the war. So let me read this passage from Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 24. Jesus had just healed a man who was deaf and dumb by casting out the evil spirit that caused him to be deaf and dumb. Do you know that evil spirits cause people to be deaf and dumb? It's not some old-fashioned tradition. It's a very living, up-to-date reality. Anyhow, when Jesus did this, we read what happened. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They made a terrible accusation. They said he can cast out demons because he's in league with the, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus answered and said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So Jesus said very clearly, Satan has a kingdom, and it's not divided. Then he went on to say, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. There Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God. So in this ministry of delivering people from evil spirits, the clash between the two kingdoms is brought right out into the open. The kingdom, the invisible kingdom of, of Satan is represented by the demons. The invisible kingdom of God is represented by Jesus and by those who continue his ministry in his name. And uh, I believe Satan particularly fears this ministry of deliverance because of two things. First of all, it brings out into the open his invisible kingdom, and he'd much rather have it invisible. And second, it shows the victory and the supremacy of the kingdom of God over his kingdom. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. For our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies. Now that phrase is taken from the Living Bible, and I think it's a very good phrase. We are in a wrestling match. But we're wrestling persons who don't have bodies. Well, that immediately causes us to adjust our thinking because we're not used to the concept of persons without bodies, although there are multitudes of such persons in the universe. Against rulers with various areas and descending orders of authority. So it's a very highly organized kingdom. There are rulers in this kingdom, each with a particular area of responsibility. And under each of those rulers, there are sub-rulers who are responsible for sub-areas in that kingdom. Now, you might say, well, Satan was very clever to devise such an organization. That's not so. The truth of the matter is that he rebelled against God, being, as most people believe, in, one, in charge of one-third of the creative angels, brought his angels into rebellion against God with him and were cast out of heaven and simply set up a rival kingdom keeping the organizational structure that they had when they were part of God's kingdom. So he doesn't get any credit for this extremely clever organization. All right. Our wrestling match is not against persons with bodies, but against rulers with various areas and descending orders of authority against the world dominators of the present darkness. Wherever you encounter domination, it's something satanic. God, that's not how God rules people. 
But Satan's ambition is to dominate the whole world. Do you understand that? Not just some little part of humanity. But through a kingdom of darkness to dominate the whole world. And because his kingdom is a kingdom of darkness, the people who are in that kingdom, for the most part, don't know what they're in. See, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. If we're in the kingdom of God, we know where we are, somewhat. But most of the people who are in Satan's kingdom don't know where they are because it's a kingdom of darkness they can't see. And then, going to the final phrase in verse 12, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavens or in the heavenly places. So, there are vast armies, you know, the word host is old English for army, vast armies of satanic beings, persons without bodies, arranged in battle order against us. It's important that we know that, isn't it? It's going to make a lot of difference in our lives if we realize what we're up against. Now, let me point out that Satan's headquarters, as stated here, are in the heavenlies. Uh, we have a lot of language in the church which speaks about Satan as if he were in hell. It would be nice if Satan were in hell, but he isn't. He's very much at large, he's very active, and his kingdom is in the heavens. Now, most of you will then begin to say in your minds, well, I thought Satan was cast out of heaven. You're perfectly right. He was. Now, the key to understanding this is that there's more than one heaven. This is absolutely essential. Uh, actually, in the first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, the earth, singular. So from the, right from the first verse of the Bible, we have this revelation that heaven is plural. Now, there are two passages in the New Testament which bring this out very clearly. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4 where Paul is talking about people he knew who had had marvelous spiritual experiences. And he talks about one particular person who was caught up from the earthly level into the heaven. And he says he doesn't know whether he was in his body or not. This is what he says. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, Paul says, this fellow Christian he knew was caught up into the third heaven. He also says he was caught up into paradise, which would seem to suggest that paradise is in the third heaven. And since there he heard the words of God, the third heaven would apparently be the dwelling place of God. Now, I am a logician, and I can't escape from logic. One thing I am convinced of, if there is a third heaven, there must be a first and a second. There never has been a third of anything without the first two. So that scripture tells us there are at least three heavens. And that's what I believe. And verse 10, speaking about what happened to Jesus in death and resurrection, it says, He who descended into hell is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So Paul says, Jesus ascended far above all the heavens. It seems to me the third heaven is the heaven of God's dwelling place. It's the holy heaven. And remember that God dwells even above heaven. That's stated in many places. Then the first heaven, I would suggest, could be the visible heaven that we see. The sun, the moon, and the stars. So in some way, the there remains a second heaven, which is never called the second heaven, which is somewhere between the visible heaven and the heaven of God's being. Personally, I believe that's where Satan's kingdom is located. But somewhere or other between God and us 
is a hostile kingdom which opposes us and seeks to hinder our prayers. And that's why sometimes we have to pray through. Do you understand? It's not that we're praying out of the will of God. It's not that God is unwilling to hear, but we have to penetrate a hostile kingdom in the heavenlies to reach God. This chapter relates how Daniel set aside a period of three weeks for special prayer. And he did what we've come to call a Daniel fast. He didn't give up all food, but he only ate the plainest and simplest food, and he drank no wine, and he ate no meat. And he was mourning before God on behalf of his people Israel, who were captives of a Gentile empire. And at the end of three weeks, a very glorious angel came to him with the answer to his prayer, which was a revelation from God of what would be the future of his people, which, which consists of Daniel chapters 11 and 12. But the angel said to him, the first day you began to pray, your prayer was heard, and I was sent with the answer to your prayer. But, he said, it took me three weeks to get through because somewhere between the throne of God and Daniel on earth, I was opposed by satanic angels and I had to force my way through those angels. So it's very clear that at the time of Daniel, somewhere between God's throne and earth, there was this satanic kingdom. I believe it's still there. And then the angel told Daniel, I've come with the answer to your prayer. And when I leave, I'm going to have to fight my way back through the same angels. And then I'm going to have to fight other satanic angels. And uh, the, the angel that came to Daniel said, on my way here, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So for 21 days, these angels were battling in the heavens. And he also speaks about kings of Persia. In the language of the King James, which is used here, I understand the prince was the supreme ruler, the kings were sub-rulers. But they were all concerned with the kingdom or the empire of Persia which at that time was the largest and most powerful empire on earth. It had 127 provinces. So Satan had one super angel who was responsible to him for the whole kingdom of Persia. But this super angel had other angels that were responsible for different areas within the kingdom of Persia. Now, this is no theory for me because I've seen in many instances and cases how this principle works. For instance, let's suppose that there were major cities in the Empire of Persia, which there were. Well, I think there was one sub-angel over each major city. As I travel from city to city and place to place, I've learned that to be effective in ministry in a certain city, very often I have to identify the particular satanic power that's at work in that city. And it's 